You've written a book or two. <laughs> but why write a book called Unshakable Hope? Well, um, you know, first, thank you for letting me have this conversation with you. Thank it you. really is an honor. I, um, I'm a pastor, and uh, as a pastor, I'm like other pastors, always uh, trying to keep my finger on the pulse of the congregation and of the society we live in to see what we need to talk about. And uh, There was something I sensed that people were very discouraged. I don't know if it was just a season or an ep uh, a time mm -hmm. which we were going through. And about that time, I read a, a, some research that said that the suicide rate had jumped 24% since 1999. Mm -hmm. And so those two factors, just the feeling that people need some encouragement, and then reading that statistic uh, made me think, you know, I think people are, we just need some hope. And, and I've always loved the promises in the Bible um, and, and enjoyed books that listed all the promises in the Bible. There's 7,000 of them. And I had never taken our church through a study of the promises of the Bible. So I, those, those ideas all converged at the same time. And, and the result was a series, uh, we call that series, uh, The People of the Promise. And, uh, and the promise was that by building your life on the promises of God, you can discover some hope, some unshakable hope. Well, I certainly had hope in my life through some of the uh, stories that you've told. You're famous for that, and, and I love to hear the stories. They're so, uh, they're so pure and uh, attractive. But I just can't imagine you having a shaky time in your hope. So I, I'm glad you have, but, but I'd like to hear about that. Well, I mean, uh, you know... I don't know how far you have to go back, maybe like two or three hours in my life. <laughs> I understand. You know, um, flying out here yesterday, uh, flying from San Antonio to D.C., uh, for whatever reason, I just was feeling uh, a crisis of confidence. We have some decisions to make at the church. Uh, to be honest, I'm trying to work my way into uh, retirement and, and trying to decide what next, what chapter's next. And I felt a little overwhelmed. And, and you know, I, I've gotten tired of saying I shouldn't feel that way anymore because I do, I, I still do. I don't know if anybody ever gets to the point where they don't uh, struggle. And so uh, the good news is that uh, rather than give in to the struggle, I tried to practice what I preach. My, my wife's uh, favorite psalm is Psalm 91, and I opened my Bible to it there on the airplane and read about, uh, you know, resting in the shadow of the Lord's wings and, and uh, finding refuge in the secret place of the Most High God. And so that passage, it, it just truly ministered to me. And uh, I still have the decisions to make, but that promise that God will be with us and we can find comfort beneath the shadow of His wings it, it meant something to me. And, and that's really what we do when we walk by faith, I think. We, we Instead of giving in to the problem, we do our best to hear the promise and respond to the promise. You remind us in the book that we are made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. But why is it worthy of such emphasis? Why is it so important to remember mm -hmm. that we are in the, made in the image of God? And, and, and really that's a promise, isn't it? Tucked away in that declaration in the book of Genesis, let us make mankind in our own image. That, that's a promise that says that, uh, that I'm different. I'm different than a piece of wood. I'm different than an animal. I'm different than a rock. Uh, I'm, I'm unique in the sense that I carry the, uh, the imprint of God within me. And you do too. We all carry within us an imprint of God. That changes the way we see people, and I don't see anybody who understands that more than the Salvation Army. The, the love you have for people on all fringes of society, mm -hmm. on all aspects of society. Uh, you see, uh, you remind us to see people that are passing through times of tragedy or difficulty or addiction or, or devastation. You remind us all that they're still uh, God's idea and that they, they deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. And so that promise speaks to the way I see people, and it also speaks to the way I see myself. Uh, there are times we all look in the mirror and we say, oh boy, you, you're not worth it, you know, you've, you, you messed up too far, too much. Uh, but the Bible says, you know, differently, that, that we're made in, in the image of God, 
and we can always stand on that promise. Take a little turn here. Um, a recent Barna survey indicated that most Christians don't believe in Satan. For, forget those who are non-believers about everything having to do with faith, but even Christians don't believe in Satan. Is that important? Why is it important? I think it's very important. I, I think it's concerning. Uh, number one, because I believe that the Bible teaches that there is a real devil. Uh, Jesus uh, dealt with the devil in the temptation in the wilderness. Uh, he, he, he taught us not to see the devil as some nebulous, uh, mysterious force, but as a real being. And elsewhere in Scripture, we learn that there's a real devil, uh, but his days are numbered. And the promise of Scripture is that, uh, is, that the, is, is that though the devil may have his impact today, he won't have it forever. We can, we can uh, look around and see the impact of the devil, you know, the killings in Chicago, the lootings in major cities, just the starvation. There's plenty of food to go around, so we tend not to share. Uh, that's all the work of the devil. Now, I think the devil would love for us to see the uh, as just a nebulous force. Because that way we don't take it seriously. I, I think a proper understanding of the Bible is that the devil says, uh, the devil, the the devil, 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 the the devil, 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 why is it so important, and you're hammering away at prayer, why is it so important that we have the prayer be a part of what makes us forgive this an unshakable hope? Well, you know, there's times when I feel like we're having to relate to those 12 songs of prayer in the highway, and there's some strap in the caverns, they couldn't get out feel like that in our lives. And we get ourselves in a situation and we wonder, is anybody up there going to rescue us? Uh, but the Bible teaches us to stand on, on the power of prayer during moments like that. And you know, verse like uh, James chapter 5 and verse 16, that the, the, righteous, uh, the prayers of a righteous man availeth much, or, or, uh, the, or, or, or the Sermon on the Mount, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened to you. The promises that are attributed to prayer are pretty stunning. Mm. And I think it's because uh, of our relationship with God. You know, we're children of God. Uh, I'm enjoying this conversation, but if somebody knocked on the door and said, Max, one of your daughters is in trouble and she's calling for you, uh, forgive me, but I'm going to get up and go to my daughter. Mm. Uh, any parent would. And God loves us with the love of a father. And when he hears us crying out to him, uh, he picks up the phone, so to speak. He, he comes to our aid. And this is the promise we find over and over in Scripture. And so I would encourage people, I, I know life gets difficult, but we're never without solutions because we're never without prayer. A little spoiler alert here. <laughs> i reveal something out of the book, but uh, I think it's okay. In the book, you mentioned that you have a special wish for your tombstone. <laughs> your tombstone. Now, we all want to know what that is. Can you tell us that without uh, ruining sales? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, think I, I think I can. Well, this particular promise, again, the book talks about, yeah, I just picked out 13 or 14 of, of my favorite promises, and I think we all need to hear the promises of God regarding uh, resurrection, you know, that, he, that, that he'll lead us through the valley of the shadow of death, Psalm 23, or, or John 14, uh, where Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If we're not so, I've not told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. I will come back. All of these promises tell us that we will die unless Christ comes first. But death is not to be feared. So it was in that context I told the story of, a, of, of driving across the highway from our church to a local cemetery. And uh, I had decided we ought to buy some cemetery plots but, you know, for my wife and me. That was before I knew how expensive they were. <laughs> I haven't done it yet. But I've always had this idea, and I ran it past the 
cemetery director, I said, is it possible to put a message in a tombstone? And he said, what do you mean? I said, I'd like to be able to put a message so that when people push the button, they'll hear my voice if they come to see me. And he said, well, that's not such a crazy idea. And he got back to me the next day and he said, I found a company that can do it. Well, I haven't done it yet. <laughs> but I, may, I haven't given up on the idea either. What I'd like to do is have a message so that when people, if anybody comes to my grave site, they press a button and, and I'll say, uh, hello, this is Max. Thanks for coming by. I'm sorry I, I couldn't be here. <laughs> but I'm home now. Mm -hmm. I'm finally in heaven. And then I'd like to say, and I also believe in the rapture. So, you might step to the side in case there's a <laughs> trumpet sound. Sure. <laughs> That's great. That's great. You, you talk about sorrow and the role that it plays in having, uh, in, not only in the life of the believer, but in having that unshakable hope, which is just mm -hmm. a wonderful title of a book, by the way. Mm -hmm. Unshakable. I think it's something we need. But what's the role of sorrow there? Yeah, um, that's in the context of a verse I use oh so many times. Psalm 30 and verse 5. A weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times I've just quoted that verse at funerals or, or at the bedside of, of people. Or, because we get, we get in a situation sometimes where grief feels so heavy. It's like a fog. It just sits on us. And we, and we can't see. You know how when a fog comes on, uh, on you, a cloud, you literally sometimes cannot see no matter what you do. And, and sadness can do that. You know, sadness uh, when you're missing somebody. When a parent buries a child, I can't imagine this, this sadness. Mm -hmm. um, there's a hopelessness that, that comes. And, and, and one of the challenges during that time of sadness is, is the thought that says, I'm never going to get out of this. I'm, I'm going to feel like this the rest of my life. I cannot imagine how I could ever have a normal life again. That is, that's what we think when we're in the midst of sadness. And I think a, a promise that God gives us in time like that, times like that, weeping may last for the night. Yeah, it will. <laughs> and the next night, and the next night. I mean, weeping may last for a time, but joy comes. But joy comes. And the scripture has so many demonstrations of this. I think about Mary Magdalene, who sat outside the tomb of Christ, mm -hmm. weeping, because she thought that not only had her her dear Messiah, her, her dear master, her teacher, not only had he been crucified, but now somebody had stolen the body. And her world officially hit rock bottom. Uh, but Jesus showed up. Jesus appeared. And there's a fulfillment of that promise. Weeping comes, but so does Jesus. One last question. Why is it important for the church, and, and maybe a church, but also the church, that everyone know and count on the promises of God. Mm. Um, a few years ago, there was a movie with Jack Nicholson in it. Uh, it was called As Good As It Gets. You ever, I don't know if you... Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I kind of like that movie. Mm -hmm. I, but it, he plays this curmudgeon old author. I guess we writers can be cranky. <laughs> and uh, he's got such a sour outlook on life. But the truth is he struggles with a lot of... Uh, psychiatric and emotional issues and, and, and one of the, the scene he goes to, to see a psychiatrist and he goes in the waiting room and the place is packed with people who are all facing problems like his and he shrugs his shoulders and he says what if this is as good as it gets well I think many people think this world is as good as it gets it's just not going to get any better and we really need a quorum of people who can with their from the depth of their heart, say, you know, it's going to get better. Mm. It really is. I know things are rough. I know things can be difficult, but God's going to get us through this. And so I think that's why the church, uh, if we could become known as people of hope, yeah. people of hope, and if, and if you'll let me just say one more time, that's what the Salvation Army does. Salvation Army, I know you distribute food. I know you distribute clothing. I know you meet people in times of crisis. But what you're giving people is hope. You're giving people hope. I don't know if you could ever bottle hope and, <laughs> and distribute it, uh, but that's like what that. you're doing. Every time you shake someone's hand or, 
or hug somebody or, or, or give them a, a place to go to sober up. Anytime you, every time you do that, you're giving hope. And, and for that reason, it's a great honor for me to, to know uh, Salvation Army folks. Well, it's been an honor for us. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Lord bless you. God bless that you. Is. Lord bless you. God bless that you. Is.